for this place to gather. We ask that your Holy Spirit would talk to us, teach us about you today. We love you, Lord, and we ask that you would help us in this journey. We ask you to bless this coming year, and would you just be with everyone here today in a very special way. In your name, amen. I need you to do something for fellowship time. Would you find someone born after 2000, after the year 2000, and greet them particularly? Don't stay where you're at. After the year 2000. Good morning, everyone. Let's have a prayer for our offering this morning. So ushers, please come forward. And, and Lord, it is time now for us to share the gifts that you've blessed us with and to spread that wealth throughout the church in helping out in our community and in others. In your name, amen. Okay, while the offering's going around, I'm going to... Yesterday I heard it was Three Kings Day. How many folks know what Three Kings Day is? Okay, we've got some hands up. I had no idea, so I did a little research and I thought I'd share it with you guys this morning. And it may seem crazy to think that Santa Claus isn't as popular in some households as he is in yours. However, in the likes of Mexico and other countries, Three's wise men are the ones that bear the gifts for Christmas, and the children leave their shoes out for them to put gifts in, and, and for the larger ones, they put them alongside of their shoes. This is also known as Epiphany, which dates back to the fourth century. Because of this, Three Kings is a vital holiday across Latin America. However, there is nothing stopping you from celebrating this day, too, no matter where you are in the world. And that's on January 5th. And you also, you cannot mention Three Kings without mentioning Rosca de Rias, something Barb tried to teach me how to say that and I lost it, but it's the king's cake and this is considered a highlight of the celebration on this date. The cake is shaped into a wreath and is studded with nuts and candied fruit, which represents the jewels of the Magi's crown. To really go down to the traditional route, a tiny baby doll of Jesus must be hidden in the cake. If you receive this doll in your serving, it means that you need to host the Candlemas celebration in February, which we'll talk about later, in February maybe. So if I'm, I'm going to opt for the eating the cake and finding baby Jesus, but there is another option, and that is on Three Kings Day, it's celebrated by jumping into freezing cold water. It may sound random, but that's how the event is celebrated in Prague. Every year people take a traditional Three Kings swim in the Volta River. You will see a lot of people wearing crowns while they jump into the cold water. There's always delicious warm Czech snacks and mulled wine waiting for people afterward. And of course, you may want to skip the cold water and go straight to the wine. <laughs> we won't tell. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I was always under the impression that the three wise men showed up at the birth of Christ following the star, and boy, was I wrong. So the Three Kings Day has straightened that out for me. And we have a couple of announcements. We have the 13th is woodcutting, and that'll start at 8 o'clock, 7 for the early risers, and there will be food served afterwards. Tonight we're starting up the Passion or the chosen again in our season two. And we are having communion today, so if you request to have gluten-free during the time they're passing out, raise your hand. We've got a young man here in the front row that's gonna make sure that you get your gluten-free. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Chuck. No woodchuck jokes? How much wood could Chuck chuck by himself? Not that much. So you better show up on woodcutting day. Unfortunately, Lila and I will be on vacation. So, and honestly, that's about the only thing I'm going to miss because uh, I love woodcutting day. It is such a fun thing. Uh, we're going to be uh, leaving for 
two weeks. But in the middle of this time, we're going to be going through a series, which I'm starting today, on our guiding values. We have five of them, and they're basically just concepts pulled out of Scripture through the years that help us do church in the way we feel God has called us to, and to, to live our lives in such a way. And uh, I'm going to share with you, with you those. Uh, there's five of them, and they start with S. I know it's cheesy, but here it goes. The first one is to be a safe place, free of judgment. We want to be safe. I'm going to preach about that in a minute. The second one is next week, we're going to have a team of three speaking on uh, serving as teams. We want you to serve as in this church and in the ministries that God calls you to, but you can't do it alone. You have to have a team. That's just the way it rolls. Uh, the, the third one is to be spiritually awake, uh, aware of what God is doing and wanting to be aware of what God is doing. Uh, Mike uh, Silva is going to be speaking to us about that subject, and that'll be exciting and wonderful to be spiritually awake. The next one after that, I'm going to come back and preach on being submitted one to another. That was the very first one, Lila and I. Uh, we came out of a church that was all kinds of troubles. Uh, and so we started a church, and we didn't want any trouble from anyone. And so we were kind of over extremists in that. But we decided to use for our main scripture, submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ. It's in Ephesians 5, verse 21. If I submit to you and you submit to me, there's really nothing we can't get past because Jesus is, the, is our Lord, and that's who we gather around. And then the fifth one is to be sent to the world. We're outreach-oriented. We we're not trying to gather all the, uh, uh, the seed here. We want to spread it out. Uh, arrows out is basically what that's going to be described as. So today I'm going to share with you the concept of being a safe place and understanding what that means. There's really no such thing as a safe church. There's just safe people that attend that church. And so I want to kind of cover that area because how many know that uh, it can get dicey when you operate with humans? <laughs> that's, that's, amen. amen. That was the, last, the loudest amen I've ever had. So uh, we're going to take the scripture out of... Uh, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Uh, this is a story of David, and he was now the new king. Saul had been killed, and he was the old enemy of David who wanted to take David out. You guys know the story some. Anyway, um, David was committed to letting the past be the past, and you'll, you'll understand it when I read the scripture. It was important for him to intentionally take someone in that uh, needed some help. So here we go, chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. And David asked, Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household, remember the enemy, named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied, and the king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, and he's lame in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. Ziba answered, He's at the house of Mekir, son of Emil, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought to Lodabar from the house of Mekir, son of Emil. When Mephi Mephi See, I was good, so good. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, said to Saul, Come to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth. I sure wish they would have named him different. <laughs> At your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belongs belong to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? This poor dude was very low in his opinion of himself. He had a life of difficulty because he couldn't walk. He was 
He was lame in both feet. He was in special needs. It was, I mean, it was a terrible situation in those days to be different. It's kind of that way today. But in those days, it, you were ostracized, and he had been. And David, representing it for our purposes today, the Lord, welcomed him and let the past be the past. And Mephibosheth walked in and accepted this amazing gift. We are all Mephibosheths. We are all coming to the Lord with this need of a, of a savior, of a person who will take us under his wing, who will sit us at the table of the Lord. This is, this is the basic need of humans when we are walking uh, this journey through life. We need the Lord. That was a good spot for you to say, right on. <laughs> right on, right on, right on. Oh, that's that Texas guy. What's his name? I want to share with you a couple of things about safety. Uh, first of all, safe is intentional. Um, David sought Mephibosheth. He, took, he made a decision. I need to show kindness to someone in Saul's lineage. This war is over. I need to make a conscious effort now to bridge the gap, to make a difference in someone's life that's not in my house, that's someone who's different than me and actually someone in Saul's lineage. <clears throat> this is a, a cool thing because uh, it's really important that we grasp the idea of you and I being a safe person for somebody is something that takes initiative. It takes us being open to it and taking steps that direction. Um, in Romans 14, verses 1 through 4, it's the, the scripture we tag with this guiding value in our pamphlets and stuff. It says this, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. You who are, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. There is a intentionality to us as we walk with the Lord that we have to express safety to somebody. Um, this can spread into our homes. Are you a safe dad? Are you a safe mom? Are you a safe child of these parents that are trying so hard? Are you a safe family member? Because Are you a safe employee? Because people can trust you to walk and carry out this relationship of love that God has called us to do. Uh, you know when you find someone and they're safe for you, uh, that's a wonderful thing. Sometimes... That's what hurts us so bad, is when someone we thought was safe blows it. Has anybody had that happen to you? Don't vote, I know. It's going to be. <laughs> so Lila and I first met each other. We were, uh, I was attracted to her. She was mildly interested in me. <laughs> and she was sitting in front of me in the choir at church, a youth choir. And I was a gymnast in those days. Trust me, it was true. And... <laughs> I can still stand on my hands, 65, not very long, and I fall down. But I would, did the parallel bars and the rings, and our hands would get calloused. And if you weren't careful, your palm would actually rip off. And then you were done for weeks and weeks. So we took care of our palms and our, our calluses a lot. And I would I'd walk around with a jug of Vaseline Intensive Care and rub it in my hands all day long. And I was a very, very mature um, sophomore in high school. And she was a freshman sitting in front of me. And I thought it would be funny to put Vaseline intensive care on my hands and then fake a sneeze and go, achoo! 
and then tap her on the back and say, oh no, look what I've done. See, this is the level of maturity <laughs> that I had. And I said, oh, I'll just rub it in, it'll be okay. I can't believe she fell in love with me. It took a long time. I was wearing her down. <laughs> but once that moment happened, we started to communicate and talk. And I remember as our relationship grew, we knew that she was safe and I was safe for each other. And we could tell each other anything. That's what, that's what builds relationship is when you become a safe person. And you can tell anything to that person. And you become this uh, safe person that is someone you can go to. And you know you have those people in your life where you can go to them because they're always consistent. They'll, all, they'll not judge you. They will be there for you. My prayer is that that's who we are as followers of Jesus, as we gather at Shiloh particularly, that we are safe people who will take anybody on that comes our way. Somebody who votes entirely different than you needs a safe person that will love them. Got quiet, so. It's intentional. David sought after Mephibosheth. He said, I need to find somebody in the house of Saul that we have been in, in conflict with. Now that I'm the king, I need to reach out. And is there anybody out there? And they found this guy who they brought before them, Mephibosheth. And he said, who, are you, who am I, this dead dog, that you would have any interest in? In loving me. And then you, he, Saul sets him at his table, which is a big deal. It's set at the king's table. It was like honor and honor and honor. Safe is intentional. Secondly, safe is experienced. Uh, you have to experience it. Sometimes it, uh, it's something that is not, you don't want to do it again. Have you ever had that happen? You know, I got sick on shrimp one time when I was 10 years old, and I was sick so long, and I'm 65, and you put shrimp cocktail down in front of me, and I have to just kind of wince for a minute before I eat it. I will eat it, but I have to get past it. And some of you are that way with relationships. Uh, I've had that before. And then I want you to do this. I want you to like wince if someone's trying to be nice to you and then go ahead and get through it and be nice to them. Lila and I, we planted a church in Shoto, Montana in 1988. Uh, and in that town, there was like a, a group of people that were living in a commune. Communes in those days, it was like um, a shepherding movement that took place and it was uh, not a healthy thing. And what happened was people were asked to live together, and if you didn't get along with somebody, they were the top candidates for you to live with. So they would live with each other, and if they had problems with that person, they would force them to move in with each other and live with. And there, on the edge of our town where we planted this church was this commune that blew apart, because that's, that would blow apart for me too. So we had a, a remnant of those folks in our church, and one of the ladies... Um, we announced we're going to have a potluck next Sunday. Woohoo! Potluck. And I was so excited about it. We're new church, just starting. So we're going to have a potluck. And this lady said, Well, I'm not going to be here next week. I do not do potlucks. Is anybody else here not a potluck person? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> just eat what your wife brings. <laughs> you see what happened to her is she was forced to eat with people and forced to have relationship and there was wounds and hurts and that food eating together thing in church was not going to happen to her I'll bet you she'd walk right past our breakfast burritos but it took a while you know sometimes it feels like you're um, feeding chipmunks or trying to feed them, you know, they were so scared of 
church hurting them again. You just kind of had to one at a time. And, and, and in time, they grew to know that we weren't going to make them move in with each other. And, and we, were, we were going to be safe. So safe is something that's intentional, but it's also something you have to experience. And it takes a little time. We had a lady who uh, was in our church before we planted our church. It's in a little town up in northern Montana. And it, this church was started, I think, in 1938. And our organist was a charter member of this church. 1938 to the 80s, she had been playing organ in this church. And I was the music guy, believe it or not. I never had the courage to do any Johnny Cash hits, but I wished I would have. <laughs> She, uh, she was on vacation, so we didn't have an organist. Meanwhile, in our community, uh, the lady who had played a lot of dances and a lot of, you know, bars and the VFW and different places, she was radically saved and went to treatment and was completely set free of alcohol addiction and she started coming to church, and I knew she could play the piano because I stayed overnight with her son, and I heard her play, and I thought, wow, that's good music. So I go down as church was starting. I realized I didn't have an organist. This is how organized we were. I just pick you out. So if you're an organist today or a piano player, we might just grab you. I went down, and I said, Cecil, we don't have an organist today. Would you play? And she said, oh, Joey, I, they call me Joey in those days. Joey, I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm not, I shouldn't play. I could tell she was a little bit like Mephibosheth saying, who are you asking this dead dog to come up here and be a part of this? And I just said, no, I think you can play for us. Can you just try? They're easy songs, and I had easy songs. And so she came up, and she started to play her music. And she was an elderly lady at this time and, and had lived a lot of life and had a lot of wrinkles in her face. And she, had, you know, she didn't look like a church lady. She had bright red lipstick. In those days, that wasn't something we did. And so it was like a lot of, lot of things about this woman. And she started to play. And it had a swing to it. And it had, the church started to come to life. And the, they started standing up without me asking. And they were singing and, and moving. And it was amazing. It was swing. It was kind of a Texas swing. or I don't know. She was all over that keyboard. Tinkling and people. And she was doing stuff that nobody knew had ever heard in church. And the church was just engaged. Plus, they were so happy she was doing it. Um, well, next week. Uh, the charter member returned. <laughs> I knew what was going to happen. There was going to be a collision of two worlds. <laughs> and so I got in front of it as much as I could, and I talked to her before the church started. I said, listen, uh, Cecil, you know, who just, got, just found the Lord and got through treatment, she's doing great, I had her play last Sunday, and it was awesome. Could you mentor her and help her in the church music that we're doing? Because I think it would be great if she had some help, because she doesn't, you know. And Cecil was, you know, rough around the edges. And she still was like a chain smoker, so, you know, there's that. Some of you are, too, so it's okay. It's your life. <laughs> well, I told Cecil that Marie was going to help her, and she was just lit up. And they, they sat together and played. A couple weeks went by, and I got told I can't play with her anymore by the charter member. I said, why not? She says, I can't take the smoke. It smells so smoky up there. And I like, okay. 
uh, can't you get past that to just help her? She's trying to quit, too. I mean, she was trying. Uh, well, it got bad. And I'm telling you a little sad story because the charter member made me decide it's either her or me. Probably the easiest theological question I was ever asked. <laughs> because the Bible's very clear about us judging. The Bible's very clear about accepting those whose faith is weak and not passing judgment. It's very clear that we're all valuable. And it's very clear that we are to be a safe place and that we are to help people experience the safety of Jesus when they in engage with us, whether inside the church or outside the walls of the church. It didn't end very well. She grabbed my lapel and she, she, she said, you weasel. That was what you get called in those moments. I talked it through with Cecil at the end, and I talked to her in the front pew of the church. And I said, and Cecil said, uh, I sat by her and I said, it's going to be okay. Uh, I just need to make that decision that you're going to stay. And she goes, and she had tears going down her old wrinkly cheeks, and she just, she goes, Joey, um, thank you, because I don't think I have anything else to offer the Lord. Um, people bring what they have to Jesus. We are to accept that gift, <laughs> whether, whether we like it or not. There is a real relationship that the Lord wants to have with everybody, and he works in their hearts and works on their lives, and then they take a step toward the Lord. We are to expand that space and, and make it safe for them to Test that water out. Safe has to be experienced. Because being safe is experiencing Jesus. I'll explain it like this. We can get involved in congregations and work and serve and miss the idea or the understanding that it's an encounter with Jesus that matters. It's the relationship I have with the Lord that matters. Now, it can look different for all of us. I'm not trying to make everybody look the same, but you and I have to have an encounter with the Lord because that's what this is about. That's what equips us to be safe. That's what's so great about new believers. You know, the old time religion makes me love everybody because when you first know Jesus, it's like, oh, he loves me. He forgave me. I'm going to love everybody else and forgive them. So then we're able to operate as David did with Mephibosheth and walk forward and let the past be the past and embrace people where they are at because we have a Savior and we have that encounter. One of our favorite people in the world was Bill and Anita Jones. They were ranchers in north central Montana and they, uh, Bill had won awards uh, for conservation work. He, the, back in the 30s, they, they plowed a bunch of ground up trying to make cropland out of rangeland, and it didn't work, and the wind came off the Rocky Mountain slopes and changed. My dad used to say a lot when he'd see the clouds of dust blowing, a lot of real estate changing hands today, he'd say. Well, Bill decided that he would have a nurse crop of barley and some sandfoin and some native grasses and get it built up and the snow would catch, I mean, the, the stubble would catch the snow and, and pretty soon, he, he won an award from Ronald Reagan. They flew him out to give him an award for conservation for the great work he had done. Well, Bill bought 50 registered black Angus yearlings that were ready to calve the next year and he was excited because he loved red Angus cattle. And uh, he clipped them all in the ears, one through 50. And he'd go out and feed them and talk to them. You know, they're more pets than cows. And he'd feed them and talk to them. And, and number 44 was missing. It was like, where is that one? And he, he looked around for a few 
days, and then pretty soon he got in his pickup and started driving around. He had 10,000 acres. That's a lot of ranch. But he, he would drive around and look for number 44. He couldn't find her. And there were a few days had gone by. It was almost a week, and he, there was an old um, settler's cabin, and, and he decided to go check those old buildings. And somehow... Number 44 walked into this shed, and maybe he thinks it was the wind that blew the door shut behind her, and she was in there. He thought he had checked that door out, and he looked, and there she was. And Bill said, she just looked at me. Like, where have you been? <laughs> and she didn't come out. So he got her some feed and some water and fed her in there. And something happened. Bill said it's called imprinting in the animal science world. This animal was imprinted with the fact that Bill was her savior. Because this cow needed help. And there was Bill. He helped her and redeemed her. And it was imprinted on her deep in her cow brain. That this guy, Bill, loves me. Bill said from that point on, number 44 was on his hip. Like a Labrador dog. And stayed with him and stayed tame throughout her career as a cow. In fact, her offspring the next year, the calf, was equally tame and stayed with Bill. That's weird. There's a lesson here, folks. We need an encounter with our Savior. We can't do this Christian walk with just a mental ascent to maybe this is a good thing to get involved with. You will burn out so quick. You have to have an encounter with the Lord and Savior. He has to imprint upon your soul that he has saved you and redeemed you. And that changes everything. That gives us ability to be safe people for those who need it. Because we have a Savior who has been for us. I, was, uh, I love this verse. I'm going to read it. It's in Luke chapter 15. Jesus tells him a parable in verse 4. He says, suppose one of you have a hundred sheep and loses one. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, this picture is so beautiful. When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, carries it home. That's just something about being on Jesus' shoulders. I don't know if I was, I was the youngest of seven and I rode shoulders a lot. <laughs> but then I started thinking about this Christmas season we just went through, quoting the scripture in Isaiah where he would be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, and the Mighty God, and the government will be on his shoulders. I am on his shoulders too. And our government is on his shoulders. The world is on his shoulders. The outbreak and the wars in this world are on his shoulders. My children are on his shoulders. And my grandkids. Oh, he is a safe savior. He is the one we can depend on to rest on. His shoulders are strong. Uh, sometimes people, um, I, I'm okay. I, my mother taught Revelations. She was a very good teacher, and she taught the Rev book of Revelations, and she'd travel around and teach it. Um, sometimes, when she'd start her talk out, this is not the Revelations of the end times. This is the book of revelations of Jesus Christ. It's the re revelation of who he is. And sometimes the church world gets caught up in what's happening next. 
Oh, no. This is happening. That means in four months, this is going to happen. And then in this generation's not going to pass. And then we're all out of here. I had a theologian teacher at school, in Bible school. And he, he said, there's a half an hour of silence recorded in the book of Revelation. He says, I know what it is. It's all of the prophecy teachers adjusting their charts. Because <laughs> you might think you know, and it's interesting and fun to try and figure it out. But as soon as you figure it out, God might say, oh, I'm going to do something different. But do you, I think he wants us to know we are on his shoulders and it's not in our mind, and it's not on the shoulders of my wife, or it's not on the shoulders of me. My future, my calling, the church's future, the church's calling and impact is on his shoulders. As we travel forward and we learn our guiding values, it is not a, a way to do church. It's a way to experience God and understand who he is and relate well with each other in that understanding. It's on his shoulders. So we can pray differently for our children, right? It's like, thank you, God, they're in your hands. Thank you, God, for my job. If it ends, it's in your hands. I hope it doesn't. It's the old prayer, God, here's my child. Help them with what they're going through. And then you turn your hand over and say, God, they're yours. They're on your shoulders. You might have something today that you're trying to pack around on your shoulders. It gets heavy. And Jesus wants to be your savior for that. He, he wants you to know you can trust him. He also wants you to know that he's safe. He won't walk away from you. He won't abandon you. He's safe. We're going to get ready to take communion because this is what Jesus was getting at when he was with his disciples. He said, whenever you get together and, and have Passover and do this, do this in remembrance of me. So if the ushers would come and pass out the, the emblems, that would be great. We're going to serve them to everybody and then take it all at once together. Because this is something that's really good to do together. Because like I said at the beginning, there's really not safe churches. There's just safe people in churches. So I want us to be safe. But I want us to be aware that we're with a safe Savior. That's the only way we can get this done, right? If you need gluten-free, some of you do for health reasons, you could raise your hand and we actually have gluten-free stuff. Don't be ashamed. We're okay with it. I did communion with my wrestling team once with Gatorade and cheese fish crackers. And lives were changed at that moment. So this is okay if you're gluten-free. Raise your hand, keep it up if you need one for gluten-free. Or pray a prayer of faith over the one you're dying for, so I don't know. Um, we're going to wait till everybody's served. Maybe there's somebody here today that needs to have that first encounter with your Savior. I don't want to miss you today, if that's you. We're going to pray together a prayer that would welcome him to be our Savior. Forgive us of our sin. And, and it's basically, essentially, putting ourselves on his shoulders. And maybe you've been brought to this point by different circumstances in your life and you're just saying, I'm ready to quit trying to carry it. I'm, I'm willing to not just try and 
struggle along, I am willing to give it up to the Lord and ask him to put me on his shoulders, take me home, okay? We're getting ready to pray here. Thank you, ushers, for doing this. We got so many people that help in this church. It's so awesome. They're like, nearly half the church is engaged in volunteering. That's amazing statistic. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took this bread. He broke it. He said, this represents my body. It's broken for you. Whenever you eat it, would you remember me? This, this body was bruised for iniquity. He took hits. He took impact that some of you have taken in your life. But this is for that. This is for that healing. And he took the cup and said, this is the blood poured out for the sins of many. This, this cup is my blood for the forgiveness of sin. And we have all been there. We've all sinned. Jesus, thank you for doing what you did. Thank you that we can come to you in safety today and take this communion. Bless it as we do. Lord, forgive us of our sin. Make us new. Help us to walk with you, trusting you with this load of life. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's take it together.